Good morning. Today we bring you an expert team who will help us learn more about smart packaging, specifically on wine labels. I'm Cotty Calhoun, and I specialize in wine and spirits public relations, not in consumer packaging. So I hope to be the person that asks all the questions that you and I both want to hear and learn. So we find out more about smart packaging and the application of augmented reality. Bringing us today with their insights and expertise to share with you, Janelle Clore, Innovation Manager for Phantom at Bogle Vineyards. Marissa McCollum, Marketing Manager for Imagery with The Wine Group. Sally McKillop, Marketing Director for Line 39 with O'Neill Vintners and Distillers and, and filling in this morning, thank you, for Christine Mall. And Peter Oberdorf, the founder of Tactic Agency, responsible for the development of many of the AR applications um, we're gonna see today and others. Smart packaging. Is it smart because it looks awesome? Is it smart because it makes me feel great that I can actually figure it out? Is it smart because we're on trend, on time and on point, reaching the consumer with these wine apps? So the brains behind the smart packaging is augmented reality, or AR. And we're going to start by sharing a three or four minute video with you to give you some examples to help you visualize what the consumer is experiencing when they activate and engage with smart packaging. One of the first black women to command the global the stage. and sheer iridescent finishes are new to my palette and help to give you an ethereal Venus glow.
All right. So we've got all these terrific examples of how these brands, or at least three of these brands, have participated in the augmented reality space. I thought we'd start with Peter from Tactic to kind of find out um, how we started in the space and the difference also between augmented reality and virtual reality. Yeah, I mean, I guess, hi everyone. Thanks for having me today. Uh, I, I guess, you know, the way we started in it was, you know, we, we were, we are, Tactics is a small, small agency uh, in San Francisco, um, small and growing agency, uh, that uh, specializes in real-time digital experiences uh, for brands. And we had done, you know, a year or two of virtual reality in, installations for Oculus Rift and things like this, but none of those were really, you know, for various brands and, and, and things like that. But none of those really um, had the scalable impact that augmented reality did off of packaging. And we had the opportunity initially with Cuervo uh, in 2013 or 14 uh, to do an augmented reality um, activation on their, on their tequila. And, uh, you know, I have to say that back in the, you know, early teens uh, of the 2000s, it wasn't really a thing yet. So a lot of consumer awareness, you know, there wasn't much consumer awareness. There wasn't much promotion of the app. We did end up getting, because Cuervo was a pretty big brand, uh, 30 or 40,000 downloads at the time, which was a win for us. But, you know, as far as the overall components and, and the overall campaign, you know, as part of an integrated campaign, augmented reality was an afterthought at that point. So a couple years later, when Treachery approached us about 19 crimes, we thought, okay, it's probably going to be the same thing. And we, uh, they initially approached us about a virtual reality campaign to make a 360 movie, and we convinced them and, and the agency a record with them that we might want to activate their packaging instead. And when we did, you know, kind of that really had a response in the industry that we admittedly didn't anticipate. And it grew uh, after kind of a, a pretty good start of, uh, of 100,000 or so downloads. Uh, it started sustaining throughout the next couple years, honestly. Uh, and we added 10 brands to that platform and uh, 80 or 90 discrete experiences, you know, across products within that platform. And it became this evergreen content channel of, of AR that at this point has well over 4 million downloads and 700 million impressions and had, you know, an, an impact on their their bottom line and their sales and, you know, an awareness about the product, that their, their various products in their portfolio to the point where they were launching products around that. And then since then, we've diversified into, you know, other consumer packaged goods with um, Procter & Gamble, Jack Daniels, Beam Centauri, different, you know, uh, and then cosmetics, you know, Benefit, and Lime Crime and things like this. So we're doing we're doing things in all areas, and we see this getting larger and larger. And what's begun to happen is Apple and Google are starting to focus on the future. And, you know, Tim Cook just two weeks ago said that the iPhone will be entirely replaced within the decade with an augmented reality device. You know, Facebook has, for both their Instagram and Facebook platforms, very robust AR authoring platform, and those are the largest social networks, and they push that very heavily and are invested very heavily in it. Um, you know, Google and Apple both have an AR native AR development platform that they're pushing very hard and are very interested in. And we're seeing that just across the board, and then Snapchat, of course, is is turning is reinventing itself as an AR social network. You know, with lenses, you know, face lenses as well as experiential lenses in the environment. So we see this as being really not a gimmick, not a marketing ploy, but very much a medium. And it's a medium that's kind of glomming on to a lot of existing, you know, things like mobile, web, social, and just becoming the next coming of all of those things. 
So it's a way, I think every company that's doing marketing now has to have a camera strategy. I think that's what it's going to become, where you, you know, we're going to have a layer uh, of something on everything in our environment, and that for, you know, marketing and advertising, that's going to be part of the landscape, is to be able to sell your message or tell your story of your brand as people are looking at it. And maybe even when they're not looking at it, or if there's out of home and media buys out in the environment, you know, making those messages pointier by having them actually speak to the user. You know, these kinds of things are, are I think, what people have to start to think about because phones are ubiquitous, mobile devices are ubiquitous, they carry with, you know, they carry them, people carry them everywhere with them, and they are more and more aware of this medium so you can reach a really wide broad audience uh, with this type of camera strategy and we have especially in the wine industry great use cases that show that to be true so I'd love to let Sally speak to line 39 and I love all these kind of new buzzwords that or they seem like new to the wine industry camera strategy um, you know when, when were we last talking about that so it's fun to see this evolve. So how did Line 39 work out? Yeah, hi, good morning everyone. Um, so Line 39 wines are a very premium, very accessible line and portfolio of wines that kind of come from the Central Coast, California, Appalachian, 9.99. Um, what I would say about Line 39 is it's this half a million case brand that no one's really heard of, but distribution's growing 20%, velocity's pulling off the shelf. What we were finding is that consumer awareness of the brand was overall pretty low. And so we needed something to kind of help with connecting with our consumers and gaining new consumers. Um, and so we teamed up with Tactic um, and developed this app uh, where we were exploring the 39th parallel um, across the United States. Um, and that's really kind of the genesis of the brand is that it comes from the 39th parallel um, through California, where we sit here in Northern California, and then where that kind of goes across the country. Um, so we launched the app in the first day of May, um, and to date we've had 17,000 downloads. Um, and that's all been driven through going to events. We had a, we sponsored a lot of music event series this, this summer. Um, we've done a lot of in-store sampling. And what's been interesting is that when we have, when people download the app during an in-store sampling, their conversion to actually buying the product is up more than 42%. Um, we have done, pushed it through social, and then we've had a lot of success pushing it through media. And the ads that we've been serving are actually served to people who are using apps already. So when they're already in a different type of app, they're getting served an ad because They've been identified and geo-targeted as someone who likes wine. So they'll get an ad from us. Sometimes it's a sweepstakes to win a trip. Sometimes it's a dollar off offer. Um, and then once we kind of get them in, it's been remarkable to see that less than 1% actually go forward with the coupon. More than 40% of the people are just engaging with the actual content that's in the app um, and trying to learn more. Um, so. It's, it's been, like I said, remarkable that people aren't just doing this for a sweepstakes or just for a coupon, which, you know, a lot of our sales team would like to think that's what causes it. Mm -hmm. But they actually want to engage. They want to know more. And this is a $9.99 bottle of wine. So I think that's pretty remarkable. Thank you. Marissa is with Imagery. So where we've just come from adventure with Line 39, we're going into artistry. Yeah, so imagery is all about artistry and uh, pushing the boundaries with creative winemaking. Um, so we have a direct-to-consumer business. Our tasting room is in Glen Ellen um, and also a nationally available tier. Um, so to kind of get to why we created our app um, and why we're here today, I'll give you a little bit about uh, the history of the brand that led us to making the decision uh, to create the app. Um, so Imagery was founded in the 1980s by Joe Benziger. Um, at the time, he was working at his family's winery in Glen Ellen and seeing these small, unique lots of wine come through um, that typically would be swallowed up into a big blend and be part of um, a bigger, more popular uh, varietal of wine. 
And he thought they were super interesting and they tasted really good. And so he dedicated his career to focusing on these lesser known varietals like Tempranillos and Petite Syrah and Barbera, that sort of thing. So that's what the tasting room um, at Imagery was built on, um, was introducing people to something new um, and in inviting the consumer to really broaden their palate. So fast forward to 2017, Joe was getting ready to retire. His daughter, Jamie Benziger, who is a millennial, um, was ready based on uh, her experience elsewhere in the wine industry and education. She was ready to step in as head winemaker for Imagery Estate. And when Jamie came in, uh, it was new energy, and she had a new eye towards the millennial audience that we are all you know, working so hard to capture. So uh, with Jamie, we decided to introduce, for the first time, Imagery's uh, nationally available tier. So a Cabernet, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and a Sauvignon Blanc, each with a little artistic twist, so blending in those unique varietals that Imagery's known for. So our uh, Cabernet has a little bit of Petite Syrah, our uh, Pinot Noir has Petite Verdot, that sort of thing. So as we were thinking about launching these uh, artistry-focused wines nationally uh, in retail in 2019. As we were building that brand plan in 2018, we were thinking about ways to help set imagery apart in the marketplace and really underscore our positioning with artistry and pushing creative boundaries with winemaking. So seeing all of the great things that were happening in the industry, like things that Peter was speaking to, um, we, we saw the trend of technology and wine um, and wanting to engage with that millennial consumer. Uh, we leaned into the idea of app development to help underscore um, our brand positioning. Um, so we found some really nice success with the app um, from getting our sales team excited. Like I think back to our national sales meeting last year where everyone was downloading the app and um, using the filters you know, to take photos of each other and some were fun and goofy. Um, but they showed up in, in presentations and in conversations throughout the year. It was just kind of a fun uh, unifying factor for the brand. Uh, and it was a nice conversation piece when you're sitting down um, with retailer conversations and with your distributor. Just a really nice tool. Um, so you know, we found that it's, it's, been, it's been very successful. Thank you. Uh, Janelle, to Phantom, getting into the fantasy side. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I think to, to speak to uh, Peter's point about having this be a new medium that will soon be uh, very common in the industry is a good point. It's a way to drive purchase. And sadly, um, I feel like the world of wine, in my time at the world of wine, it's just been over 10 years, it's changed drastically in that time. And where you used to be able to just have a great quality wine and maybe an accolade or two, um, you were really able to move the needle. And the wine it sold itself, and that's what happened at Vogel for decades. Um, so when I landed at Vogel, I knew that one of the first things I wanted to do, um, because I was fortunate enough to have been at Treasury while uh, 19 Crimes launched and the Living Wine Labels launched, and I was fortunate enough to work on the Matua brand, which is the thermographic label, so I led all the innovation there. I saw the success that it brought to each of these brands, and then many brands. Um, so when I landed at Vogel, I knew it would be very important to be one of the first to follow and to leverage in this immersive technology. And we're really glad that we did that um, because our, our Phantom brand now is not only relevant to consumers, but probably more importantly to distributors and buyers and gatekeepers. Um, so I think it's definitely worked uh, in our favor. Our sales team, uh, we just did a survey monkey and unanimously, 100% of the sales team said that it was their most effective sales tool this year. And it definitely got cases on the floor. And so that's what we're here for. Um, so we're really excited at Vogel and the marketing department that we were able to leverage this technology. And then, then it's the winemaking, um, the winemaking team, you know, it's them, it's their job to do every bottle after that. And so, you know, Phantom is great wine. So we are, um, we're very excited um, of how it all came about. And I guess I'll tell you a little bit about the Phantom brand. A lot of people don't know, but uh, Bogle is actually uh, Scottish for ghost or apparition or phantom. And so that's why uh, the Bogles went into this, this other uh, brand of Phantom. 
And ironically, uh, there are a lot of stories of a ghost or apparition at the winery and in the cellar. And not only the winemaking team, but employees and even the Bogles themselves, uh, the employees that have been there 25 years have all these stories of the Phantom. So for a decade, the Phantom brand had trouble marketing these stories. They have so many stories, not just one story, but so many stories. And if you've ever heard a really good ghost story, I'm sure it wasn't a short one. So it was uh, challenging for the brand at first. Um, and that's some of the things I think we would have done differently when we first started. Uh, we tried to tell a linear story through augmented reality, and um, we got a lot of drop off, and we realized that people weren't, you know, staying in tune with the story. So that's when we decided that we would do something a little bit more fun um, to keep people's interest and get them to re-engage with the app. And so we weren't basically just a one-trick pony. Uh, we introduced gamification. And I, I went to Peter and the team, and I said, let's do something fun. Um, let's give these people a reward for um, enjoying the app. Let's give them some kind of perceived exclusivity where they want to come back and um, keep playing a game or go to a new level to unlock new stories of the Phantom. And so that's the way we were able to integrate through gamification and really playing to the medium and doing something fun that gets people's attention to set you apart from the competition. And then we folded in the, the long phantom ghost stories uh, through videos. And we have basically, right now we have three small, small produced films uh, that you're able to look at in our vault. So the consumer's able to see those stories in their own time when, whenever they want in their real time. What's, what's that? Pretty nice. So I think it's interesting the layers that have happened um, in the evolution, which is a somewhat short evolution, but nonetheless an evolution of how uh, using this technology is working. And I think Peter's got something on his mind. I know he's ready to say, but no, I, was, I also I, was just... I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, Janelle is always pushing our team to kind of innovate around new ways to think about this experiential marketing, you know, and she's got her finger on kind of like things that she sees out in the environment that might be applicable to uh, your industry and has been a real innovator in this as far as, you know, ways to uh, kind of challenge kind of the existing strategies that are out there. And I think they've been able to reap some of those rewards in doing so. Uh, and, you know, obviously the story hasn't been told on the right way to do this. This isn't like, you know, in terms of this type of digital marketing, it, the ground is always moving, like, super fast. And, and to take on this type of thing, I think there, there, there are inherent kind of strategic risks, but uh, the rewards, I think, are potentially immense because you can get a direct line. You know, one of the things that we discovered about this industry, which you guys could tell me a lot more than I know about, but like, uh, is that it's, you know, the three tier kind of sales, uh, challenge, challenge, <laughs> is, you know, <laughs> connecting to consumers in real time is, is a real challenge. And, and in, in a way by having either an app based or what's increasingly becoming social or web based types of experiential media, you can connect with those consumers live figure out what bottles are picking up where in real time, mm -hmm. gather all of that data, and then tailor your marketing directly to that. So all of this also involves back-end analytics. There's you know fun pictures and games and things like that to do, but we know when somebody picks up a bottle of Chardonnay or Pinot or whatever particular brand, and that data is being directed to the brand live when they do so. It, I mean, if we don't know their favorite color or where they live or anything like that, but we mm -hmm. do know that somebody picked up that bottle of wine three times, you know, and then they might have picked up another product within that brand line as well. Mm -hmm. and we can infer a lot from that. So as we start to learn more about the data behind this, it can be a real data-driven, you know, way of looking at how people are engaging with these different brands. And with many of our clients, you know, we're rolling these out to 82 different markets around the world. So we translate the experiences 
even in narration or voiceover in, in all these different languages. And then you can really get kind of broad insight as to how a brand is performing both nationally and internationally with this data coming in all the time. We integrate into Salesforce. You know, we're starting to do Shopify into our experiences. So you can push people to buy other things. They engage with one product. So there are, there are a lot of opportunities, you know, contests and direct messaging. Oh, the sweeps. Thing, sweepstakes sure. that yeah. Janelle is doing. Like, yeah, it's, it's incredible. So I think it, it's, a, you know, that's why I refer to it as a medium. Uh, and the ideation around it is challenging because there, there isn't like a lid on exactly on what can't be done, you know, like, mm -hmm. so, so I was so hoping I think, that we could yeah. also move into that, the, yeah. the idea of yeah. the challenges and mm -hmm. yeah. maybe Sally, you want to start, but talk to um, either tips that people in the audience could shortcuts, tips, of what happened that it, they could do, sure. you would do differently next time. Yeah. So I'd say first piece of advice is find yourself a good partner, like tactic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you need someone who knows what they're doing and who's super experienced in this space. Um, I can honestly tell you that I don't speak augmented reality or half the words that Peter can use in his regular <laughs> vocabulary. So it's really important to have someone who can. Um, the other thing I'd say that was a challenge is um, time. This is not a project that can be rushed. You have mm -hmm. to be patient. Um, you have to know that it's going to take a while to develop. There's going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be content that you think really works and mm -hmm. then it doesn't. Um, and so you're just constantly changing and learning. Um, I'd say another challenge that we may have encountered too is um, getting this through. The wine industry has a lot of folks who don't even know what this is, don't even know what this means. And a lot of those people are the ones who are making decisions on how you're spending your investment and your money. And so in order to try to say like, no, this is going to have an impact on the business, um, and we need your money to help us go make that can, can be challenging. Um, and so seeing some of these results that are coming through across Line 39, but across some of these other brands too, is really helping the wine industry evolve because I feel like we're, we're a little um, sad sometimes. I don't know, like we, we just, we need to evolve. Um, I think beer and spirits are doing really cool things. There's no reason why wine can't be operating like a beer or spirits company too. So, um, and I think the other thing is that you can always go further. We kind of are always looking at the app being like, okay, next year we need to tie this better to a direct-to-consumer strategy and come up with a subscription model for people to be able to kind of always be able to, to buy Line 39 and kind of avoid the three-tier system and just have the, these products that they're engaging with and that they like delivered directly to their door. Um, you know, we found out <laughs> that there are... 39 days between Thanksgiving and New Year's, so next holiday, <laughs> for everyone who has the app downloaded, they'll get a holiday tip every day um, that's quick and easy and snackable and digestible um, to help them through the holiday season. So there's just, like, the opportunities are endless. You just kind of always have to be thinking about it and uh, have some investment tucked away so that you can be, you know, it, augmenting your augmented reality. Mm -hmm. Marissa, do you want to share your experiences? Yeah, definitely. I would echo a lot of what you just shared. Um, one of the biggest challenges for us was the time that it took to develop this. Um, imagery is a brand, um, you know, as I said, built on artistry and creative winemaking. It has a lot of other factors that we're focused on, and the app um, is sort of one aspect of the brand, not necessarily what the brand is built around. Um, so for us, the, the time to build it, I would say it was about eight months to a year. And the idea when we initially started with it, with this idea of um, lifetime video uh, filters that transform your reality into an artistic uh, artistic reality was really uh, unique and people were doing it in photo filters but not with lifetime video. So uh, I'll never forget about two weeks before we launched the app, um, I was perusing Instagram and saw on an Instagram story one of the celebrities that I follow published her lifetime video of her world being filtered in watercolor. And it was like, okay, well, our idea is no longer brand new. However, that doesn't change fundamentally why we developed the app to underscore positioning. It's still cool. It's still not you know, super widely known. So all was still good. So it was just sort of a lesson in how fast technology moved uh, versus sort of the pace at which the wine industry moves. So 
the good news is that we have the um, the, the app has been successful regardless, and we have the technology now built, and a lot of the, you know, the cost associated with and the effort with building the app all happens, a lot of it happens up front. So now we can continue to evolve it, um, and as long as filters are relevant in people's lives, which they seem to be, uh, we have, you know, sort of a runway of where we can take the app in different directions um, going forward. Go ahead. Um, so challenges, definitely timing and execution. Uh, what we thought would be great in our first year would be to do four different seasonal experiences. And what it did is it just put us up against a timeline, uh, a non-negotiable timeline, where we had already communicated with our distributors and given them a one-pager and hyped up the augmented reality and this new experience is coming and it's going to be September 1 and you're going to see it. And then there's a lot of factors that come in that, you, that are just unforeseen. You, you, don't, even, you don't even know um, what maybe Apple has in store for you. Um, I guess what I, I'd like to touch on with Apple is that Sometimes updates or uh, new launches can, if it's something that's already out there, it could be five hours. But if it's a complete new build and experience, it could take four or five days. And you're at their mercy. And you have already communicated to sales and everyone that you're going to have this big launch. And the last thing that you want is to put something out there that's not up to par, that's not um, working properly that has too many bugs or glitches. or um, Because as soon as somebody tries to do something for the first time, and as we know in technology especially, and you have any kind of trouble with it, you don't revisit it. You don't re-engage. So um, it, could be a, it could be a trouble for, for the brand. And it causes a lot of stress for not only um, whoever is managing the project, but the stakeholders that are involved. And, and for the tactic team, and you're trying, you're working with these incredibly creative developers, and you don't want to rush them. You don't want to rush the creativity. So I think it's really important to build in your uh, buffer of timeline, and I think that's what we're going to be doing going forward. We're going to just breathe a little bit more, maybe do a new experience, one, maybe two a year, and um, and go from there. Um. Hey, what else about Apple? Oh, from a technical standpoint. Uh, they liked your experience. I, we, oh, that's good. We, uh, Apple had called us in. I, I was telling Janelle just uh, this week, they had called us in to talk about augmented reality, and we showed them all our stuff. You know, we're very proud of our stuff, whatever. And, and then the next day, they called back and and asked about the Phantom Wine, <laughs> and we're trying to download it, because that was something that their development team was in particular really excited about, oh, cool. the, the, the games and stuff on the, on the, on the bottle. That was yeah. something they were, you know. I think they hadn't seen anything like along the line. Of what we were well, we're going to come up with more, yeah. aren't we? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm really excited. You know, it's, it's fun to... Um, build this world and um, to reward your consumers and uh, to play in this space. Uh, it, it's been really great. Um, back to, I was going to say from a technical aspect, what we really wanted to do was something where you could use the forward-facing camera and the outward-facing camera at the same time, and Apple doesn't have that capability. Google and Android, you're able to do it there, but Apple isn't there yet. I thought that I found that very interesting. So that limited us on some of our, ide our ideation. Um, they also randomly institute uh, certain policies, and more recently, um, that can cost you know, incremental spends that you have to be aware of. Um, and you have to maintain the app uh, as if you were to maintain your website. So you have a new SKU, you have new um, a new accolade, you have to, right. you have to update packaging it. Packaging changes. Right, packaging um, changes. And, and then we have to know what the packaging looks like. We have the software find it. Right. You know, things like yeah. that. Yep. Um, and then I thought Peter would probably speak to this. And uh, I know I've, I've talked to um, the girls about it a little bit. But from a creative perspective, 
um, you're always wanting, you always think about something that you want to do in the middle of the project as it's already going. And you're like, oh, wouldn't it be great? We could do this, though, and we should do this. But if it's out of scope, um, it's going to cost more money and more time if you want to get that through. And, and sometimes your stakeholders are uh, determined to have that change. So you have, you have to work with that. Um, also, natural elements like fog, smoke, fire, water, uh, they behave really well on the two-dimensional plane, I guess you would say, um, where you can, of, of the label real estate. So anything within the, the bottle label, uh, an augmented reality team can basically have a film and layer it around with the curvature. But once you get outside of the bottle, is that's when things kind of look cartoon-like and kind of can sometimes cheapen, you know, what your, your brand and your brand identity, which is not what you want to do. Um, yeah, and then, oh, the technical. Okay, oh, go ahead. One I'm more. Sorry. Yeah. Last sure. one. Yeah. Um, if you're, the, the software has a difficult time distinguishing between similar labels and also uh, between similar bottle shapes, and then, you could run into an issue where the 14, your, your, your vintage 14, is playing the vintage 15 um, experience. And then it can look a little janky or off, and you don't want that to happen as well. So there's a lot to think about. Yeah. Well, one thing I was thinking maybe you would like to know um, is if you don't quite have the same budgets to pull this amazing... Uh, technology off. Are there ways to get in anyway? Are there ways to do it um, with either technology that that exists that isn't unique to your particular package, or are there what any suggestions you have on on ways that other wineries that might be smaller budgets could well, can play in the space? Yeah, I mean, I think premium content is premium content, whichever medium you're, you're trying to do. So that has an implicit cost uh, to make. A 30-second animation in a medium is, has, a, has a cost uh, in post-production, editorial work has a cost, things like this. I think, you know, just speaking holistically, like, to have people download a bespoke app, you need to have a critical mass of compelling content. This is fun and content-driven first. If it goes straight into 10% off marketing speak right at the face of it, Nobody's going to download a branded app. You know, nobody wants to download the United app to learn more about United Airlines. They want to download it to watch a free TV, you know? So, <laughs> or to upgrade their seat. Right, or upgrade their seat or something. They, yeah, what's in it for me? So low barrier of entry is really important. You know, putting the fun in front of it is really important. Uh, I think all of these examples, you know, both stuff we try to do and, and other folks are, are doing, you know, fun first. And that's where, where it gets sticky to consumers, which is good. Uh, but, you know, I also think that uh, you need enough content to get people involved. So if it's five seconds or something, they're not going to download the book app or if they do look at the internet once they see it. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, for us, it does involve maybe a strategy so that people can look at this in a sustained way so that the experience gives them two to three minutes of engagement initially. We have easy ways to share to social and share with their friends mm -hmm. so that they're able to expand the audience. You know, the, our brand partners are able to expand their audience and tell others about it very easily from the platform. I just learned that we had 15% of our users in the past year shared the experience. Right. right. Right, and I mean, and I think, yeah, that's pretty good. And then as the ground is shifting to address smaller groups and wineries, what's beginning to happen is companies like Snapchat and Facebook are offering marker-based experiences that are small, and maybe a little simpler, but more bite-sized in terms of budget and how they can be executed on social networks. And so... Maybe the results are more incremental, but the, the amount of work that goes into them are a little more incremental, and they have a wider spray, you know. So you can end up 
you can you can have something that triggers off of uh, out of home or or packaging and has a rich story experience that maybe it's told in a segment through a social feed and then that can reinforce your communication through social as well. So if you have a Facebook page or an IG page, that can be a way of just putting in a little bit of experience and content directly to the medium that everybody already has. Likewise, there's there are platforms that work right off of the web. So if you have an existing web page for your winery, uh, now you can launch AR directly from that as well. Mm -hmm. So that these are it democratizes it. You know there are qualities to how those would all be executed, but but definitely they can make smaller segments of projects mm -hmm. and more kind of casual engagements mm -hmm. that often are more affordable media buys as well. If done. Did anyone else want to add anything to a, a different barrier to entry or if you I, had a smaller brand, how you might execute? Uh, I just, I think, you know, going and partnering with a, you know, with a Facebook or Snapchat or Shazam where you can, you can automatically just, you know, most people, a lot of people already have that app and then you can open up the camera camera finder from there and you have basically a QR code or um, any kind of icon that you could put on your bottles or a, you know shelf blade or anything and then it could happen right then and there there's no download you need it there's less steps to take and that really works out well in the sales channel too um, when you don't want to have you know, go through the whole app with somebody and, you know, our salespeople have so much time to pitch and you, we could do something that's a smaller, uh, a smaller experience that, uh, that is a lower barrier to entry. And one thing to, to note about that is as those things are becoming, you know, as they can recognize labels, specifically that means that rather than just having promoting brand awareness, every Every activation is a brand enhanced activation where a person has to plant somewhere in the bottle, which has a post to do it per, you know, it's not just a consumer kind of thing where, you know, that's kind of the point of the get people to go and pick up the bottle. So if, you, if every activation involves that, you know that it has you know, incredible compared to just a banner ad. Or some type of general so we have some of the bottles from these brands that after this is over, we'll we have we'll put them on stage around these tables, and if you want to play with them and download the app or use my phone and do it, you're welcome to test. But I wanted to offer questions from the audience, and um, Hannah has a microphone. She's starting in the back, and we'll get to you. Thank you. Hi. You mentioned budgets, but you didn't say what this costs. Well, so you sorry. noticed. Approximately. <laughs> what was the question? I, I think it varies. You know, I mean. Right. So actually, let's maybe we can go through and. Whether you can say exactly what you spent or not, I'm not going to tell you to do that. You can decide. But the ROI would be really helpful as well. Yeah. Sally? I'm not going to tell you how much we spent. And it, honestly, O'Neill Fitners and Stillers, we are not a massive company. Um, we are not one of the, the big ones. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you we spent a whole lot of money. Um, but it also didn't come cheap. And so that's where I was saying earlier, just kind of getting the stakeholders to to agree to an investment that might be higher than something that what we've normally done in the digital space. Um, right now, with like our 17,000 downloads, I'd say like we're probably under $10 per um, downloaded user uh, when you talk in an ROI type thing. Um, and our goal was to hit 20,000 downloaded app users by April and we are gonna hit that by January. So um, I think it depends not only on what you're gonna spend, if you're gonna spend money to develop a unique app, you also need to have some type of investment to figure out 
how to get people to come to that app. So the whole marketing aspect of it. it yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's all, it, you need it all. And so what we've found that's been really cost effective is that in-app ad service that we've been doing. That media buy has been a very low um, media buy for us and it has increased things tenfold. Plus you can, like we've um, targeted California, Texas, Massachusetts, Colorado, New York, New Jersey. You know, like you can get so specific on who it is that you want to go after, um, and then you can get those qualified buyers where you have distribution, um, so that you can kind of continue that conversation. So Marissa. I kind of like went around the question, if you notice, <laughs> Marissa. <laughs> yeah, I can't share numbers either, unfortunately, being um, with the wine group. It's a privately held company, and uh, as far as measuring the ROI, it's actually been it's a little bit challenging. Um, the the app is pretty new um, still for imagery, and um, even with you know the successes with you know um, buyers and all of that, there's a lot of things that we're bringing to the table for imagery from you know our winemaker just being named 40 under 40 to um, you know accolades around the wines that sort of thing. It's it's kind of hard to tell what exactly is moving the needle other than anecdotally from um, our sales team. So I think as time goes on, we're going to be looking at more specific measures um, for that. So. Should we come back in the future? Maybe there's more than I can share, but uh, that's about it for right now. Janelle? I think in the future we will be able to look um, if it's driving purchase. You will be able to put um, different things in the app. You know, we're going to slowly introduce IRCs and couponing and things like that so we can bring it back and, you know, then we'll have that data. Uh, right now it is difficult to measure, um, but we have a steady increase of downloads. And what we do is we, we try to create a great synergy with our, our Phantom brand. It's, it's great for Halloween, so we do a big push for September and October. We have incentives for our distributors with DA support, and we get them all hyped up about the app. And then we have incentives for the consumers with the sweepstakes. Uh, we just did an inner, um, inner for a chance to win $5,000. But you had to download the app, in order to enter the sweep. So we more than um, tripled up our downloads during that month, which was great. And we saw a conversion rate of 75% of people that downloaded actually entered the sweep. We only had a 25% drop off. Um, and, that, and that did really well for us. But you know, the amount of cases that we pushed through with the DA support and the app and incredible, well, it was pretty good POS that points to the app. I think it's all those things. It's the synergy of it all that you can kind of gauge more of your ROI at this time. And then as we get into um, IRCs, I call them IRCs because they feel like they would be instant, but they actually technically call them MIRs. And companies like Enmar are on the forefront of this, and they're on and they're ready to have an MIR that you can target in each state. And because as we know, there's lots of legalities and compliances with that to go along with that. So it's kind of hard to gauge when you're on a mobile app where you are, what state you're in, maybe you're traveling and then you want to buy at a discount or, prom or promotion. Um, but things are moving in that direction. And so I think in, in good time, we'll be able to uh, see the RRI pretty clearly. Another question? I have a quick question. How many times do you actually... Oh, I don't need a microphone. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I don't have as loud a voice. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I guess what I, what I could say is, you know, just anecdotally across different brands, uh, there is not a running average that's that's sort of democratized across all of our activation. Some hit harder than others, and even from our point of view, it's hard for us to entirely predict 
there are a lot of variables because, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, if we make the world's most perfect app for uh, digital marketing um, and no one knows it's there, it, mm -hmm. it, will never, it will never see the light of day, you know? But <laughs> then what we find is with very established brands that have, you know, uh, robust social and other things like that, like, you know, taking Coca-Cola or something like that, it supercharges whatever they have. And they're seeing, they're seeing, you know, their returns be enormous right out of the gate, you know, compared to other strategies that they've taken. Um, and then, you know, in the wine industry, taking uh, living wine labels as an example, they have uh, users monthly still, uh, two, two and a half years down in the hundreds of thousands monthly still. And um, uh, most, many or many of the brands involved have seen e like, you know, uh, like 19 Crimes, for example, is well over 200% increase in sales since the launch of the app. And um, so I think that broke any metric they might have in terms of targets and success, but, um, you know, as far as how to measure that in a democratized way across every activation we do, I think it, it's, it is a medium, so it does vary by brand and by strategy and by story. And I think some, some brands, you know, this is an industry that already, you know, like, I, I kind of feel like, um, the wine industry, more than spirits even, every label has a story. There's so much storytelling in this industry, you know, and, and there's so many labels and packaging that's evocative of a story. So very visually driven brands uh, have a great chance of success at, at creating experiential mar digital marketing because people want to see and hear more about these images that excite them as they're walking down the store shelves. And, you know, I know just as a lazy consumer myself, that's what attracts the eye in the first, in the first place. And so if, if there is a, a compelling image or something to work off of, we see those being very successful in this medium, you know, versus a very stoic, you know, neutral labeling or something like that. So a lot of the time, you know, a starting off point is, is important, but it can really amplify that with this meeting. I can give you a stat. A mm -hmm. third of our app download users have used the app more than twice. Oh yeah, at least. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting yeah, yeah. Well, some of our seven to ten. Yeah. It it does vary. It does vary. It I does vary. Yeah. And and I just looked at um we have a, a software that Tactic recommended to us. It's called Mixpanel. And you're able to go through um, funnels and filter. And you can look very closely at where someone started in the app and where they dropped off in the app. You can see which experiences that they're, um, they're leaning towards. And all of ours with gamification are the ones that are getting re-engagement and have been the most popular. You can see whether or not you know, you're getting 200 people you know, over um, a period of three days is usually what we average. It. That's how many people in startups that we can kind of see. And then I just saw at Thanksgiving, um, we had three times the amount of downloads in startups during the holiday. And also three times the amount at um, Halloween as well. So this is kind of telling us that people are engaging with the brand and the bottle at social gatherings, big social gatherings, and then they're taking it to the next social gathering. Um, because I feel like these are not only bottles that tell a story, but they're kind of like a magic trick. You know? And you you're walk into a party and you bring this to the table and you show somebody, especially someone who hasn't ever seen anything like it before, and they are just wow. And then people at that party want to be the person to bring it to the next party to share with those people. So it's um, a, a social platform for sure. Another question? Oh, sorry, we'll get to you. Go ahead. 
Yeah, just to tack on to that, I'm wondering um, for your estate winery, what sort of opportunities might exist? Say, for instance, you had a, a Google AdWord campaign to drive uh, club lists, sign up newsletter, or even uh, tastings. Um, does the label in your experience drive uh, consumers to the website at a conversion rate analogous to Google AdWords? We definitely um, have a conversion rate. We, we have many different points in the app that push to the website. Um, if you want to learn more about the wines, if you want to learn more about where you can buy the wine, I um, can't remember. I think that's that those are the two points that we pin, we push to the website. Right, and there's there's technologies that we're beginning to implement, like deep linking, so that if somebody engages with the app, we know the journey they reached, download the app, and if they found out about it, website mm -hmm. through you know a social share, like you know friends. So. These technologies exist not just on our platform, but on others. So we want to find to where we, you know, how we can end up on the website or how an app, or, or likewise, there are ways to do that. They're a little, you know, nefarious in GDPR. In Europe, there are some restrictions on what you can collect. Great, but there is quite a bit of, of analytic information online uh, or that technology platforms and, and for how people are arriving at versus other tools like the platform. Our brand is not like an estate brand by any means, but 40% of the app users um, go to the website through the app. And for the most part, 40%. Um, and for the most part, they're going to uh, the product locator. They want to know where they can get the product. Mm -hmm. There was a question over here. Oh, I was. I think Janelle spoke to plans going forward, maybe kind of doing like two campaigns, if you will, um, in the coming whatever fiscal year, calendar year, however you're. Um, Structuring your timeline, but for everyone else up there, are there plans? You know, the very vague spending <laughs> that was spoken to sounds like a sizable investment, even for companies um, of your size. Are you are you going to do more? And if so, how much more? Yeah, I, I. It's like you were saying the the shaky ground. You have to do more, um, mm -hmm. and you have to continue to provide them the content that they're going to come and stay for, return to. Um, so that's where I was saying, like, we can sit in brainstorms all day. We could have a brainstorm right now of all the different ways that you could use this type of tool. Um, I think I was mentioning earlier that we're not personally doing enough right now with the direct-to-consumer space, and this is ripe for that. Um, so, and I think the gamification um, is also super interesting. Um, you know, what we found with a lot of success is partnerships. So we partnered... Um, Line 39, again, is all about kind of that 39th parallel and with the platform, um, all about kind of daring to explore. And so we partnered with um, this service called Pack Up and Go. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of them, but they're basically a travel agency that um, will give you your itinerary the day before, and it's a surprise of where you're going. Um, and so <laughs> utilizing partnerships like that even, that, that goes with our brand mantra and kind of what we stand for, and then we offered that as like a, a trip to win. And, you know, the winner chose Kansas City because she'd never had barbecue there before. And she was like <laughs> from right here in Berkeley. So, <laughs> so it's really interesting to be able to kind of weave in as many different things as you can in order to keep it fun, um, but on brand and something that is going to, again, just kind of keep people coming back um, so that they not just opening the app the one time. You want them to want to come back. Marissa, yeah. Yeah, and imagery, um, 
our app being more of like a lifestyle filter app. Um, there's lots of runway for you know various versions that we could offer. There's lots of ideas going on right now, and luckily we can be much more nimble and quick since the foundation of the app is in place. Um, but there's lots of ideas, um, including you know co-releasing filters with influencers, that sort of thing on social platforms um, to make them feel relevant and interesting and of value to the consumer. So all sorts of things that we're exploring for 2020. So I know officially our time is up, but I think that we're allowed to stay in the room a little longer because the, there's an hour break. I'm not suggesting we're going to be here another hour at all, but I'd be happy to take more questions. Um, but I also, in case you need to leave, I just want to say thank you so much for coming today and thank you to our panel for being here and, and sharing these experiences. Thank you. Thanks.